From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. You are here. You are you. And that makes this stuff they don't want you to know. Featuring, of course, our super producer, Paul Mission Control Deccant, who, I have, a, I have it on good authority, has never himself purchased something uh, involved with a murder. Oh, well, that's nice. That is certainly a claim to fame that Paul can attest to. He's got a whole heck of a lot of cool posters, though, for movies. Right, right. And then murders may occur in those works of fiction. Mm, They definitely do. But Mission Control is not the kind of cat to go out and read about maybe a series of stabbings and say, I need to buy that knife. I want a piece of that action. Mm -hmm. I want a shoe from a victim or something like that. Yeah, I was... I couldn't believe that that existed before we did this episode, Ben. It's a weird thing, of course. (laughs) Paul, I I promise we will stop using you as an example. As far as we know, uh, none of us, Paul included, have purchased this sort of memorabilia previously on stuff they don't want you to know, we had explored numerous stories of serial killers, specific cases such as our unfortunately ongoing uncaught serial killer series and larger phenomena such as the Highway of Tears. Or even the East Area Rapist slash original Night Stalker. Right, right. Uh, D'Angelo had just been caught and we had mentioned this, I think, just briefly in in an earlier episode. We might have to do an entire follow-up on that because it leads to some wide-reaching implications for genetic testing and yeah. DNA bases. Didn't we do a whole episode on the ori- – we did a whole original we Night did. Stalker episode. Wow. We did, yeah. And uh, we wondered whether he would be caught. We did speculate on his age. Mm-hmm. And overall, we we weren't wrong. Remember we said he might be listening – he could have been listening. That's true. He could have. I don't know if he's a fan of podcasts. Uh, allegedly, he's a recluse. Okay. Uh, but they found him through some relatives' DNA. Well, we'll we'll dig into that, so stay tuned. One thing's for sure, though, there are probably going to be people who attempt to um, to associate themselves with this in one way or another. You know, it's a, it's a very cold comfort for the surviving victims and it's a um it's a closure point for people who spent years decades of unpaid time investigating this today we're touching on serial killers but in a little bit of a different way we're not looking at so many specific cases and we're not tracing murders themselves instead we're exploring an industry that sprang up around these grisly tragedies a monetization of monsters made flesh And here are the facts. We've already explored how law enforcement and criminologists define serial killers, along with the problems inherent in that definition and the difference between the way these murders are depicted in fiction and the way they actually behave. But we haven't explored the other side of the dark mirror. We haven't looked at the public fascination with these crimes and the public fascination with the people who commit them. Yeah, and this stuff probably might, let's say might not apply to you. But uh, it's overwhelmingly likely that somebody you are an acquaintance with harbors this weird curiosity. I say weird. For me and for, I guess, for the social mores of the world, it is a bit strange. Hmm. This fascination with serial killers, murderers, people who go out and take lives. Um, People like this read exhaustive biographies. They read accounts of the, the actual killer's activities what occurs before the MO of the killer. Mm -hmm. Um, They can likely compare differences in motivation between killers and execution and apprehension uh, for multiple killers. Oh, so we're talking about someone who's able to say, well, the difference between John Wayne Gacy and Jeffrey Dahmer is the following. Yeah, and we'll, we'll sit down with you at a bar and tell you the differences for an hour. I have been guilty of that. (laughs) Yeah. I think, and, um, I think, 
everybody has that fascination to some degree, right? Mm, yeah, there, because it is so different from normal everyday activities. Yeah, and there's a book we found uh, from 2014 called Why We Love Serial Killers in which criminologist Dr. Scott Bond explores the nature of this. And he notes the same things we've seen in, in previous arguments about this fascination. He says there's a difference between perceptions of killers and reality. Uh, and he does a lot of myth busting in this book. If you are at all interested in this topic, we highly recommend it. One of the myths he busts is that the majority of serial killers are believed to be white males. However, according to the FBI, the race by race, the racial breakdown of serial killers is about the same proportion as that of the U.S. population at large. And based on the Radford University Serial Killer Database, which, holy smokes, is a real thing, uh, only 46% of serial killers since 1910 have been white men, and that's using data for a little less than 4,000 killers, or maybe uh, right at 4,000 now that they've added the Night Stalker. Well, here's the thing. You know, none of us, including uh, Paul, Michelin Man, Mission Control, Deccan, own any of this um, these keepsakes of any kind of serial killer. And yet, I'm, a, I'm fond of serial killer movies. I'm not as into true crime as it would seem literally everyone else on the planet is, but it is obviously a huge booming business. Where do you think that fascination comes from that makes, you know, the average Jane and John Doe off the street want to kind of dig into some of this stuff, whether it's in reading books about it, uh, listening to true crime podcasts, watching films, or, you know, exploring some of this uh, this darkness? Yeah, and we have to – we'll stick with this perception of, of uh, serial killers being overwhelmingly white and male to, to hit on this because – when we bring up fiction in the zeitgeist, what we see is that even if the facts bear out that not all these killers are white males, the ones who get remembered in pop culture do tend to be white male killers. Uh, the, and Bond has a couple of theories about this. He says the, the gender difference may come down to a matter of method. Female killers, in his argument, tend to be less uh, – g- use less gory methods like poison – and sh- uh, rather than shooting, but uh, one of the most famous or infamous uh, female serial killers in the U.S., Eileen Wuornos, was uh, murdering people with a gun. Bond thinks that's the reason why she reached fame, but only 9%, or around 9% of serial killers since 1910 have been women. Uh, 40% have been African American, and few have achieved uh, celebrity status. There's the disturbing thing there. Is it choice of victims? Bond believes most serial killers tend to kill within their own race and that white victims, especially white female victims, usually get wider media attention. So there's a there's a loop here uh, between victims and killers and the media. And so this racial bias, as disturbing as it is, is real. And according to Bond, he says, although it may not seem fair, affluent white neighborhoods are given priority over poor black or Latino neighborhoods by state officials in the assignment of valuable policing resources. This negatively impacts the ability of law enforcement personnel to pursue serial murder cases in poor racial minority communities. So society is valuing these victims less and it's making, as a result, uh, it's making the crimes, as horrific as this sounds, uh, be presented or perceived as somehow less important. And this means that the infamy of the killer also becomes uh, uh, lower. Yeah, because they're they're not spending the resources to catch the people that do them. And when you're not spending the resources to catch them, you're not getting the media attention. You're not – I mean there's all – he Bond makes all these – unfortunate points about mm-hmm. the reality of our situation, of racial bifurcation. And so there, to that point, if we if we use this uh, information and we, we ask ourselves the same question Noel was asking, you're asking about um, fascination with serial killers, we have to ask ourselves, does this mean we are more fascinated with a stereotype mm-hmm. rather than an actual phenomenon? But... We can't go too far or too fast down that path because it turns out there's solid evidence for the American obsession with serial killers, and it's not particularly promising news. Uh, There have been more than 2,600 serial killers in the U.S. since 1900. England, who has the next highest total, has had only 
142. 2,600 to 142. Uh, we also, in the states, have higher rates of violent crime, and that might be why some killers are more famous than others. Because, again, throughout the world, even though serial killers exist in other countries, throughout the world, when people picture a serial killer, they usually picture either Jack the Ripper or someone from the States. 